Welcome into the Cubs Recap Podcast, the presentation of our recap channel on YouTube. That's R E K A P and available audio only everywhere you get your favorite podcast with my partner, Gordon Wittenmeyer. I'm David Kaplan. All right, Gordon, we're going to get into a number of topics here. First, we're going to start with it's a lot of smoke that the Padres might be willing to move Juan Soto. Their ownership is not happy spending the inordinate amount of money they spent, and they don't think they can get him re-signed to an extension because it's going to be approaching $450, $500 million, and he did not have a great year this year. So if he's available, he's got one year left before free agency. He has Scott Boris as his agent. The, what I'm being told is he won't come cheap because he's going to make Thirty million in arbitration, or whatever you agree on, and you're going to have to give up good players. But you probably don't have to give up your top two guys. Would you do that if you are the Cubs? Well, let me just back up a minute. I don't know what you consider not a great season or a great season, but this dude played every single game, led the league in walks, and hit 35 home runs. Mm -hmm. Had a 9.30 OPS. He's going to get MVP votes. I don't mean first place, but he could finish in the top six in MVP voting, six or seven, uh, for a team that didn't make the playoffs. He had he had the best offensive year on that club, um, a club full of stars, by the way, and he's not yet 25 years old. So uh, I think he had a great year. I think he's exactly the guy you should get go all in to try to get from a hitting standpoint Yep, because he's that left-handed bat because he's so young, because he does so many things for you. And uh, he, you could, you could justify the big contract for him. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and I don't know what, what else you have that can approach this coming in the system. I mean, this guy was, you know, they, that, that, that term generational player gets way overused. Um, if you, if you believe most of, uh, most of the people in our business who use that term there, there's a uh, 50 generational players every year. This guy actually is this guy for the first three, four, five years of his career compared favorably to like Ted Williams and nobody else. Right. Well, that's so, what they called him. They called him little Ted Williams or the next Ted Williams. That's what I'm saying. So, so yes, if you can, you should absolutely be all in on trying to get him. It's obviously a long shot just because the demand figures to be high enough that some, at least a few other teams are going to come in pretty hard on him. Some of them might have better farm systems or more, or, or, or players uh, maybe willing to give up more players, uh, maybe even willing to spend more. I don't, I don't know. The Cubs absolutely should be in on this, and they should be in on it in a big way. Okay, so if they said to you, it's going to cost you, leave the top two guys out of it, Pete Crow Armstrong and Cade Horton, and but it's going to cost you anybody pro else. Prospects I mean, three, four, five, eight. Like we're talking yeah. about a haul out of the system, and you only get them for one year, and Scott Morris says, no, I'm not. We're not signing an extension. We don't even want to talk to you about an extension. Do you do it? Yes. Tell me why you do it. I'm not saying you're wrong. I want to know why you, you you'd do be willing. Because you're to the do Chicago freaking Cubs. And even if Scott says, well, we're not going to sign an extension, uh, he's not going to shut the door either. Basically, when he says that, what he's saying is, you can talk to us in free agency just like everybody else. And the Cubs should compete with every anybody they want to in free agency. So just because he says we're not signing an extension doesn't mean you won't get him long term. Ultimately, if that's what you want, if he likes it in Chicago. But never mind that. Let's assume that that that's off the table. You're in a position going into next year where you damn well better make the effing playoffs. It's been too long. This year was too big of a collapse, too much of a disappointment down the stretch. That's not going to be acceptable next year. It should not be acceptable next year. So you should be all in on this. A guy that's going to essentially replace Cody Bellinger and put up bigger numbers, play more games, and be 
the key to that whole lineup. You don't have to do anything else to your lineup if you bring this guy in. Honestly, I mean, defensively, you know, you, you're going to look for incremental fits, the things that, that fill out your lineup, but you don't have to do anything else to create offensive impact in your lineup if you go get this guy. It's a big price tag, player capital, the, the, the $30 million or whatever he's going to make as an arbitration-eligible guy, whatever. You're going to have to pay that. If it's a one-year deal, that contract's not terrible, and you still need to go get pitching, but you only need to add that one guy to, to have the offensive impact that you're looking for if you go get him. If you get him, now how do you navigate your outfield? Because Ian Happen say is Suzuki have no trade clauses. I don't care. I, I'm you not also, saying you should. I'm you asking also, you, how do you navigate that? Well, you also have a DH spot. Yeah. So so um, you you put it out there. I mean, he's not he's not a, a gold glover. So no. so you don't you don't have to say, all right, dude, we're committing this position to you. Now, I, what I don't know is how, wh- where his mentality is, his psychology when it comes to DH, because you can't take the chance that he's going to be one of these guys that struggles with that, right? And and then uh, does, hates it and, it, and it impacts his production. So that's the only thing you have to consider when it comes to him on that. And, and so, uh, uh, so again, I go back to I don't care if if he's if he can DH he DHs. If one of these guys can play first base, they play first base, and that's how I handle it. So if you brought him in here, does that shut the door on Cody Bellinger because you yes. still need a first baseman? It absolutely shuts the door on Co- Cody Bellinger. Why? Why? You're the it's- Chicago freaking Cubs, is what you keep preaching to me. Right? Are you only going to do? Lineup guys, this replaces that left-handed mon. This upgrades the left-handed monster in the middle of your order. You don't, you don't. It's not like you have this desperate need for two of them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend the resources, particularly the player capital, to go out and get him if you're just going to keep Cody Bellinger and pay him the same amount of money. Uh, y- you still have to focus on improving the pitching. So uh, assuming that there is some limitation to what they're willing to do, then get one of these guys. I do like the idea of Soto over Bellinger. Get one of these guys. If you're going to focus on Soto, get Soto. And then focus entirely on pitching other than that. Yeah, I, I agree with you on getting Soto. I vehemently disagree with you. I'm not saying they're going to get both, but if you get Soto, that should not preclude you from going to get Bellinger to be your first baseman because you still have to find one of those. Yeah, if well, Matt Mervis is the guy. Great, I'm not convinced he is. Let me uh, l- let me uh, throw one word of retort to this. Angels, how much money did they spend on Pujols and Rendon? And they had a homegrown guy in in in, uh, in Trout, who they gave a massive extension to. Then they went and added Shohei, who uh, to their lineup, but he was a pitcher too. So 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 maybe don't even count him. But they spent all their marquee guys that they added for a decade mm-hmm. were huge bats, and they haven't sniffed a championship. But I'm not signing Soto Gordon to a long term deal at that point. I'm pushing and you better team. win right now. And if you're going to win right now, you need more effing pitching. Period. Agreed. Well, but then- why can't you, Gordon? What do every what do the smart executives say? There is no such thing as a bad one year deal. I'm right. test driving Juan Soto. I'm getting five years with Cody Bellinger at whatever the number is. I can afford both and get pitching. Okay, go ahead and do that. I don't think they're going to do that. You're asking me like, I think Soto's plenty and I think it's going to be tough enough to go out there and compete and to add the pitching you want. You might even have to go into the trade market to do it. So I want to keep some of those bullets available for that too. So if you're asking me, I go Soto. If I, if I think I can get either one and I have the choice, I get Soto. Now I think they're both long shots. Right, you're you're asking me a, a capothetical. 
And so and th th those are worth about what they sound like they're worth, right? So, if you, but if you're going to box me in on that, that's my choice. I think you got to get one. You take one year of Soto as opposed to five guaranteed years of Bellinger. Well, you're not going to get Bellinger for five, but yeah, if, you, if that's what you're putting out there, either one. Yeah, I go. I, I I still go for Soto for that one year. I think Soto is more bankable any given year than any other player is right now who might be available. Yeah, I'm not saying that I'm expecting Soto, Otani, Bellinger, and the Japanese pitcher. I didn't say that. But what I am saying is you have got to find a way to get A, star power, B, left-handed, difference-making pitching, I mean, to be hitting, and then a top-of-the-rotation starter. Yeah. Then you can win a World Series. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you throw star power in there. And, and again, we can discuss how that's defined. You need to go out and, I mean, Soto's star power. Cody Bellinger these days is star power. Cody Bellinger's not superstar power. He's not. Oh, okay. I'm talking about Soto, Otani, guys like that. I need a superstar in my lineup. The Cubs don't have one guy with the exception of the last 85 days of, of uh, Suzuki. Not one guy do you go, he hits top three on the Braves. He hits top three on the best team in the American League. We don't have that guy. Dansby Swanson on a good team is a seven-hole hitter. No, and I'm not sure that just going out and getting that guy is, is going to make that difference all by itself either. And I'm not sure how many of those guys are available. It's part of why I say, boy, if Soto's really available and you're really serious and you're willing to give up what it takes to get him, go get him. But I don't know how many of those guys are out there. One of the things, one of the things that Jed did, and you, you, you and I both had our different criticisms and differences of opinion with the things that they've done, including what Jed's done. But one of the things he did that worked these last couple of years, in particular last offseason, was by run pre prevention. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what it does, what run prevention does is, you know, what, what, what do they say? Fielding doesn't slump, right? Correct. I mean, you know, guys have bad days. That's not what we're talking about. But you, you put a bunch of good fielders out there, and they've got – debatably probably not even debatably the best middle infield defensively in the league. And then you can discuss if, if it's in, in all of baseball, but I would say in the league, best middle infield, Cody Bellinger was a plus glove wherever he played. And, and you got a, a, a left fielder who's got a gold glove on his resume and say a Suzuki's won some of those awards. We'll forget that game down the stretch, but he's won some of those awards over in Japan and they had Jan Gomes, a plus defender behind the plate. Those kinds of things are why they were able to have some uh, success for streaks and that great month they had coming out of the All-Star break. That needs to continue to be part of their success. You know, you talk about things like plans. That's part of their plan, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, so if you want to say go get Cody Bellinger and then get and then keep that glove side of that equation in him and get him on a five year deal or he's probably going to be looking more for more like seven or eight and he might get it. I don't think anyone's given him an eight year deal. I do. We'll not. find out. We didn't think Chris Bryant was going to get what he got. I keep going back to that. Somebody's going to give it to him. Yeah, and at some point GMs are going to stop being brain dead and look and go. What a stupid deal that was. We're Dude, not doing it. They've been saying the same thing for 100 years. Long before free agency, they used to say this. Owners used to complain about player salaries back before Babe Ruth. Go, go back and look some of this stuff up. It's the same shit that gets said over and over again, and this is an $11 billion industry with continuing I'm revenue. I'm not asking growth. them to play for Social Security. Well, what I'm saying is that this, it, it doesn't, it, it just it, it just doesn't hold water. Somebody's going to give them the friggin' money. Just, it, it happens pay, every year. Pay him shorter term, higher AAV. So I get you off my godforsaken books if you stick. We'll see. We'll see what happens on that. Maybe that works. Maybe they get him for that. Maybe that's a way to go. But back, back to your point, I mean, 
you know, this idea of run prevention, that also involves pitching. So this is something that they're going to, I think this is the direction that they're going to look. I think it's probably the way to go, given the success you've already had incrementally these last two years going that direction. And you've got some coming in the farm system. So I like that you are the Cubs. You should go big and go try to get somebody of impact who's available out there. And, and if Soto's available and you got the players to go get him, go frigging get him. All right. Next topic. Is Kyle Schwarber, and this was courtesy of Gordon. He texted the group, you and I, um, today. You, you and I were texting and said, okay, I want to ask this question to you. Is Kyle Schwarber the worst non-tender in baseball history? And the answer is not even close. Not even close. It was a trick question to you. So it's, it's David you. Ortiz. David Ortiz. Best. David By Ortiz. Far. And Johan Santana. He wasn't a non-tender. He was a rule five. He was a rule five. So yeah. it was Roberto Clemente back when rule five uh, uh, rules were different. Um, but but Schwarber as- was an egregious mistake, not letting him go because he didn't perform well. It was egregious because, A, they didn't replace him. B, they only did it to save money. They didn't do it and say, he doesn't fit here, but we're going to go get that guy. They just let him go. They just did it for money. And and what makes it in some ways worse than Ortiz. So, so the question is, is it one of the worst two? I think it might be. As we sit here right now, I think it is, given all the circumstances. So I've asked baseball people about this over the course of this past year. And I can't get long-term baseball people who like, well, let me think about that. And they don't come up with anybody comparable to those two, right? And one of the things that makes it a little bit worse for the Cubs is that his projected arbitration number was about $8 million. So he figured to make about $8 million the year they cut him loose going into the 2021 season. So instead they say, we're not paying the 8 million. We cut him. Uh, He becomes a, a free agent. He signs with the nationals for 10 million. So, they were going to pay less than what turned out to be market value for this player. They had him at less than market value and they let him go. Now, back when Ortiz was cut, his, his projected uh, arbitration number was probably about 1.95, 2.2 million dollars. Then this was back in 20 coming off the 2002 season, I believe. Correct. And and Theo's boys picked him up in Boston after about six weeks of sitting out there. They got him for a million and a quarter. So at least Theo's boys got him for under what the arbitration number would have been. At least the twins realized they were paying more than he would probably get on the open market. And the twins tried to trade him. Um, the uh, the Cubs tried to trade Schwarber, too. But but people knew that these, these guys were non-tender decisions and they were going to get a shot at him without having to, to give up any players for him. So, uh, so there was no trade market for him. But when you know Ortiz sat because he couldn't play defense, and and he had been hurt recently, so n- nobody knew what they were getting. Theo, if if Theo's honest with you, he'll tell you he didn't know what he was getting. He stockpiled a whole bunch of DH first basemen that year going into spring training, and Ortiz didn't even become a regular player until like May. Correct, and then he becomes a Hall of Fame player, and it's like, oh my God, yeah, exactly, like, right. It's the same thing when Theo told me when he he puts out a survey to every scout and baseball employee, not the ushers, not the security, not the business. Every baseball ops employee gets a survey at the end of the season. And Jed's continued this and they put it on your desk and And you fill it out. You know, what do you think we should improve? And what did you think of this? And what did you think of that? If and the last one question, three agent pitchers, which one should we get? No, it says, is there a player who what? is struggling somewhere else that you believe a change of scenery could help? And he said, I looked at this form and I had a bunch of dudes that wrote Jake Arietta, and they went and got him. And the funny thing is, and I confirmed this with the White Sox. So the White Sox agree to a trade. For Jake Arietta before the Cubs get him. 
They agree with the Orioles, and they're trading. God, who was the reliever that the White Sox had? He was a journeyman, pretty good setup reliever. I'll look it up while we're talking. And the Orioles agree to the deal, and the White Sox reliever fails the physical. He gets back on the market, and the Cubs get him. Well, that wasn't ahead. Of, that was a close to a month ahead of the trade deadline that year, and and uh, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to say that 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 account is is wrong because I, I can't. That that's not the account I heard. And if you're and if you're going out there and you're saying, hey, who do you think's having a about who, who's a bounce back candidate? Uh, th- those certain. This is an off-season survey, right? This is the year before survey, correct? Yeah, so this is going into, what year was that? 2013. Uh, 2013 season. Um, So, you know, he had to, you know, struggle again in 2013. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to remember. I know he was Baltimore's opening day starter in either 12 or 13. It might have been that year. Here it is. In the 2013 season, the Baltimore Orioles had some interest in acquiring White Sox reliever Jesse Crane. And until Crane hurt his shoulder and never pitched again, they were on the verge of completing a deal for Jake Arrieta to the White Sox. In in, uh, 2013, before the Cubs got him. In the same time frame. Yes, that's way ahead. I mean, uh, so you're talking about a, a deal that would have been all but done except for the physical. And yep. then the Cubs come in right after that and they do scoop them up. All of this close to a month before the deadline. Yeah. That's a very strange turn of events there. I was told that uh, th- that the Orioles were in a position where they were done with Arietta. Uh, in terms of uh, they were they were in a position where they were willing to trade him and that during that season it was brought to Theo's attention look this guy is has a lot of talent they're not using him right they, they've tried to put him in a box it's it's not working so uh, you should go try to get him and don't just believe me go send your scouts out there to look at him so they did they decided that uh, this advice was accurate and they took it. That's, that's the way I heard it go down. I didn't hear it go down as anything that started before the uh, uh, season began. Yeah. So that, if that goes down, who knows what happens with the Cubs? Like everything can change. But my point is you never, I don't even know how we got into that conversation, but, Everything changes if you don't have quality pitching to get back to your point when we started this whole thing with Juan Soto, and now the Cubs need to go get starting pitching, and we talked about Kyle Schwarber being one of the worst non-tenders in baseball history. That's for sure because not just did you lose the left-handed power, he would have taken you through in terms of a leadership role. You've developed a new chemistry. Now he would have replaced that role with Rizzo and Bryant and Baez and all those, all those dudes, they'd have had an unbelievable leader in their clubhouse. Let me ask you this. If you knew you were going to get between 155 and 162 games out of him each year, which is what the Phillies have gotten the last two years. And you knew you were going to get, 46 or 47 home runs each year and an average of a hundred ribs and a hundred runs and an on base percentage. Like he's always had right around the three fifty range. If you knew you were going to get that, would you have given him an extension at some point of four years, 79 million? Probably right. Probably right. Yeah. So not only did you whack him for the sake of what was what amounted to eight million dollars, just money, and just lost him for nothing, but you could have probably kept this guy. And I can tell you, talking to Dombrowski, they love him in Philly. They love his clubhouse presence. Um, he we know that firsthand. 
And, and by the way, he's done nothing in three years since he left the Cubs, but make the playoffs with the Red Sox who traded for him after that first year. And he made an all-star team that year with the Phillies last year. And he made an all-star team that year. And they got to the world series that year and the Phillies again this year. And they've got a chance to get to the world series again after winning. They've won four out of five series um, since he joined the club. Now, they also have Bryce Harper. They have Zach Wheeler. They have a, a, a really nice team. But but we know what Schwarber's brought to that club. And just statistically, you know, this dude, this dude hit 197 this year. So almost 20 points lower than he hit last year. But his yep. on base percentage went up by 20 points because he led the league in walks. Yep. And he hit all those home runs. And he drove in all those runs. And he scored all those runs. Uh, and he brings what he brings to the clubhouse. He's only missed the playoffs, I think, once in his well, career. Well, he played in the playoffs in 15, 16, 17, 18. Uh, the Cub- Did the Cubs make it in 18? Yeah, they made it in 18. That was the year that they uh, went as a wild card and got beat. Okay, they didn't make it in 19. So they went right. in 50. That's right. They went 15, 16, 17, 18. Didn't make it in 19. Made it in 20. In 21, he played for Washington and Boston. Gets traded to Boston. They go to the playoffs. They beat Rizzo's Yankees. And then he goes to Philly, and he plays in the World Series in 22, and the playoffs, here he is in 23. Now, three different franchises. He's only missed the playoffs once. And by the way, the year he missed the playoffs, they won 84 games, and they were in it. I think they won 84. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But they were in it until about a week, 10 days left in the season. They were still alive. In which year? 19? 19. Yeah. But in the, again, I'm not here. Lord knows I'm not here to defend the Chicago Cubs, but he did Wait it. A minute. That's all you ever do. No, I'm the hardest on him because I'm, we're the hardest on the people we love. I'm, I'm the one who's you willing are the to hold them accountable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. The, Chicago Cubs, Kyle Schwarber's numbers in 2020, 188, 308, 554. Ain't real good, bud. Ain't no, no. real good. 100%. And, and 2020 was the pandemic season. 393, 701 OPS. Right. So it, it was the it, – and, and by the way, for for the hit numbers and the batting average numbers, that's that, – to be able to salvage a 700 OPS – uh, when you're hitting like that is, is not nothing, but, but that was the pandemic year. That was 60 games. A lot of guys had super down years, guys that bounced back after that. And we know what happened, right? And this, and, and he's the example. He, he will always be history's example of how Cubs ownership reacted to the pandemic losses, the, the, the short term pandemic losses um, that year with a competitive team and they, they ran, they ran scared from, from those losses. And part of that was, I mean, it's one thing to trade you Darvish for a boatload of prospects and, and, and hope that they turn out and, and it looks like one or two of them might have, but it's another thing to just cut a guy over money over what amounts to a one-year contract, get nothing for him. And it turns out you were like just dead wrong in a baseball sense. And, and really the intangibles as well. I don't think – well, I'll let you go on this. I don't think Jed would have released him if he hadn't been given a mandate from ownership. I do not. I think 100%. Jed liked That's him as a said. player. This, is a, this was an ownership decision. This was how ownership responded to the pandemic. And, and so I agree with you on that. Yeah. Gordon, have a great rest of your day, man. It's always fun chopping it up. We'll get into it, I'm sure, again next week. And All right. They go out and trade for Juan Soto. I'll just uh, take my bow. Yeah, you, you go ahead and take your bow on that. Get it we'll done. And, and by then, the way, and then, and then we'll see if, if we'll we'll see if they sign Cody Bellinger right behind that. We are going to get Scott Boris on this pod, and we are going yes. to talk with him and have some fun. Yes, we have been in touch with him, and he's agreed to come on. We're just trying to uh, find a time that works. You got it. Have a great rest of your day, man. All right, you too, Kev. All right, for Gordon Wittenmeyer, I'm David Kaplan. That is another fun, spirited edition of the Cubs Recap Podcast, a presentation of our YouTube Recap channel. Please hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so you never miss any of our content. And it's available audio only 
everywhere you get your favorite podcasts. For Gordon, I'm Cap. Take that.